Christianity for Beginners, this is lesson number seven in this series entitled The Christian Lifestyle. So in our sessions so far, we've covered some of the basic ideas and teachings of Christianity. And I just want one final review before we move on here. First lesson was reasons to believe in a personal, loving, and all-powerful God. Lesson number two was the difference between Christianity and other world religions. In other words, what makes Christianity so special? Third lesson about the Bible, we looked at the history and the compilation of the Bible, as well as why Christians believe that the Bible is inspired. In other words, it's produced of God and not man. Lesson number four was about Jesus Christ, who He is, what the Bible says about Him, what He did, why He is important. Lesson number five in the series uh, about salvation. We looked at the subject of salvation and how the concept and the promises in Christian salvation are different than the concept and the promises of any other religion, and I believe superior. Lesson number six in the series was about the church and how the Bible describes the model or the pattern for establishing the church according to the New Testament in every generation. If we follow the pattern for what the church is supposed to be contained in the Bible, we can produce the same church in the first century, the fifth century, the 21st century, the 30th century. It's always the same church. Why? Because it's based on the New Testament, uh, New Testament uh, pattern. Okay, so in our final lesson today, I want to give you a description of what the Christian lifestyle is like, and hopefully dispel some false images of Christianity that a lot of people hold to. So we're going to start with the misconceptions, misconceptions uh, about the Christian lifestyle. I suppose that the two most popular misconceptions about the Christian lifestyle are the following. The first one is, you're not allowed to have any fun. <laughs> No fun, uh, you know, uh, in other words, when you become a Christian, you have to abandon most of the things that you enjoyed doing before you became a Christian. That's a blanket statement. The idea is that Christianity is about obeying a strict set of rules. So you have to kind of throw in the towel, you know, and okay, I'll become a Christian. Yeah. And the second, most popular uh, misconception is that all you do as a Christian is go to church. A lot of people refuse to become Christians because they're afraid that they'll be obliged to attend church all the time and they, they, they don't want to go to church all the time. The false idea that Christianity is mostly about attending worship services once or twice, even three times uh, per week. Now there's a germ of truth to these two ideas, but in the end, they are expressed in such a way that distorts the true lifestyle experienced by one who becomes a Christian. And of course, every lie always, has, every good lie has a, a, bit of, you know, a bit of truth to it to kind of help the medicine go down. So we're going to talk about the true Christian lifestyle. When somebody becomes a Christian, they should expect a change in their lifestyle. That's the idea. When you become a Christian, you should expect a change in your lifestyle. The Christian lifestyle means that the individual has come under a new circle of influence. That's the change that is taking place. Paul the Apostle explains this in the epistle of Colossians chapter 113. He says, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness that's where we were before we became a Christian. We were in the dark. We didn't know the truth. And transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. That's where we are when we become Christians. So there's a transformation that takes place. And with the transformation come other changes. You know, uh, you let go the things of the darkness and you embrace the things of the light. So of course there's going to be a change, there has to be a change. So in this, Paul compares the ideas, the philosophies, the motivations of the material world to the teachings and revelations and leadership of Christ 
in the world of the kingdom. One, he says, is darkness, and the other is light. Since Christians now live by a different set of realities and values, there's bound to be a change in thinking and behavior. You can't avoid it. If you say, <laughs> if you say well, I, I was not a Christian and then I became a Christian and nothing changed, well, something's, something's wrong. You know, so something's wrong. All right, number two. In the Christian lifestyle, a person is motivated by a new spirit. Christians are motivated by the Holy Spirit of God. They're not self-motivated. Big difference. In this world, it's all about being self-motivated. Pick yourself up, pick yourself up by your bootstraps. You know, come on, you can do it. You know, whatever your heart says, you can do it. They never say die, you know, never say die. Follow your heart, all that stuff, you know. So before becoming Christians, most people are focused on self or what is important for me. Our society is filled with all kinds of programs and books and experts who promise to help us find or improve ourselves. The government, movie stars, scientists, authors, every kind of expert want to show us how to be more healthy, more beautiful, more secure financially, more successful, uh, how to be better parents, better athletes, better than our neighbor, better for the environment. Yeah, I, I remember in the wintertime they show this commercial and I forget for uh, so some sort of cold remedy you know, that you take. And the commercial shows a young woman and she, she wakes up and she's not, she's sick. You know, I mean, you could tell she's her head, this bed, she could hardly talk, blah, 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 blah. And uh, uh, she takes the cold remedy, you know, and, uh, and the, the, the person is speaking in the commercial said, don't let anything get you down. Don't let anything get in your way. And what does she do? She puts on her leotards and her, her track suit and her running shoes, you know, and she, she goes out running and outside it's raining and it's cold and damp. Sure, that's what you ought to do when you're sick. That's what you ought to do if you get up and you have a fever and you've got a, a sinus infection. Of course, get dressed and go run in the rain and the cold. <laughs> but they sell the medicine telling people, yeah, you can do this. We can help you to be tough. The focus is always on how to maximize our lives here on earth. How not to waste even a morning because you're sick so that you can continue in your, you know, your workout routine. How do we make the 70 or 90 years that we have to live here on the earth, you know, on average, how we can make those 70 to 90 years we have the very best 90 years. Of course, the idea underlying all of this self-motivated improvement is that this life is all there is, so you'd better make the most of it. That's the point. If you're just going to die and there's nothing else, well then this is it. <laughs> You better not waste any of it because you've only got a little bit of time. Christians, however, are not motivated by self. They're not centered on self. They're not focused on this world exclusively. Obviously, we have a focus on this world. I'm looking at everybody here, you know, we, we have children, we have grandchildren, you know, of course, we're focused on important things that belong to this world, but we're not only focused on this world. That's the important difference. Jesus said, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Christians live in this material world and are subject to all of the same challenges, opportunities, and experiences common to everyone else, except one thing. For Christians, their motivation is spiritual. Their goals are spiritual. Their values are biblical. A Christian will focus 
his life, um, uh, excuse me, a Christian will focus on the life that comes after this life, not just this life. The object of worship for Christians is not self or the things that are important to self, but rather Jesus Christ, the one who offers eternal life. This difference in life center, this difference in life objectives is what creates the unique Christian lifestyle. Yeah, I'm paying attention to what's going on in my life here on earth. I have to, I got to work, I got to you know, watch my health, of course. But I'm not only focused on that. I also have an eye on what's to come. So it's a lifestyle not marked out by a change in clothing. There's no uniform or special dress needed to be a Christian. What a Christian puts on is Christ himself. Again, Paul says it this way in Galatians chapter three. He says, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. And so the Christian lifestyle is the character of Christ being developed and perfected in the character of the Christian on a daily basis. You know, what's my job? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm an accountant, I'm a nurse, I'm a teacher, I'm a whatever, I'm a construction worker, I'm a salesperson, that's my job. And I want to be good at my job and I want to succeed at my job and I want to do a good job, you know, and I want to work profitably, yes. But my job is not my goal. My goal is heaven. My objective is to please the Lord. My value system is what I learn from the scriptures. I'm thankful for my job and I, and I want to find a job that I'm good at and that I enjoy and you know, be profitable. Nothing wrong with that, that's all good. But the objectives of my life are not centered on my job. That's from a Christian perspective. As I said, Christians are subject to all the same experiences as non-Christians, but the difference is that Christians view and react to these as Christ would, not simply as a human being would. For this reason, all the elements of life are seen through the vision of Christ, not the vision of man. So for example, the environment. The environment is not just for saving, that's a worldly perspective. That's a high and noble worldly perspective. The environment is for saving. People giving up their life to save the environment. But for a Christian, the viewpoint of a Christian, the environment is for managing. The environment is there as a witness to God's creative power. Big difference between the views. Money and power are not for hoarding or for fulfilling self-interest, but rather for use to the benefit of those in need. Conflicts are not resolved through power, but through prayer and forgiveness. Stress and worry are replaced with concern and focused ministry and prayer. See the difference? Poverty and illness are not simply a curse to be avoided, but an opportunity for service and generosity. Trials and obstacles are not simply to be overcome, but they are God's way of testing our faith and creating patience and hope in us. Failure and sinfulness are not causes for criticism and shame, but they're an opportunity to know God's love and forgiveness. And finally, death is not to be feared and avoided at all costs, but for the Christian, death is something expected with the courage and confidence of one who will continue to live after they die. Somebody says, you know, what's the difference between the Christian and the non-Christian? Well, the way they see things the way they approach problems. So these are some of the attitudes and approaches 
to life experienced by Christians. Remember, we're talking about the Christian lifestyle. How is it different? Well, one of the ways that it's different is that we see things differently from other people. We see the environment differently. We see politics differently. We see things differently. So these attitudes, these goals, this motivation creates a daily lifestyle that is much different than those who have not believed and devoted their lives to Christ. So you may not be able to detect who is the Christian simply by the way he or she dresses, because there is no special dress code or special mark on the outside. The women don't have to wear anything to cover their face or their head. And the men don't have to wear, you know, on certain days, a hat or, or, or other type of garment to identify their religiosity. There's nothing like that. I mean, for that alone, I'd be a Christian. <laughs> Just for that alone, not having to wear a uniform to identify my, my religion. I, you know, I'd say, is there any religion where you don't need to have a uniform? And they'd say, well, Christian, all right, I'm, I'm, I'll be a Christian. Of course, you know, I'm only joking as far as that's concerned. But we identify not from the outward stuff, you can, however, discover who are the Christians by the way they live and how they treat other people and how they deal with life here on earth. So when you observe or live the Christian lifestyle, you will see Christ himself living and acting in a person's life. Because the way a Christian sees the environment or the way a Christian sees an obstacle is in effect the way that Christ sees the environment, the way that Christ sees an obstacle, the way Christ sees failure and so on and so forth. So let's review a little bit, okay? I said that there is a change in lifestyle when one becomes a Christian because, number one, he comes into a new circle of influence. He's not self, he or she is not self-motivated but rather motivated by the Spirit of God. There's one big difference. Secondly, a Christian has a new and different motivation. People who are not Christians are motivated by money or they're motivated by self-interest, they're motivated by even altruism. You know, Christians are motivated by the Spirit of God. A third reason for the change also. A Christian, a Christian lives rather have a new direction. We come into a different circle of influence when we become a Christian. We're motivated by something different when we become a Christian and our lives now take a different direction. Now the main activity of most people in the world without Christ is consumption. That's the main activity, consumption. We consume food, we consume entertainment, we consume money, power, information. Without Christ, we desire to be served, we desire to be praised, to be cared for when we're sick, to be honored when we do something good. I mean, that's just what life is about without Christ, we consume. The Christian lifestyle, however, requires the exact opposite for the follower of Jesus. For the follower of Jesus, the, the goal is to empty, <laughs> is to empty ourselves. The goal for people who have not received Christ is to, is to fill themselves with as much as they can in this world. Paul explains this uh, uh, this idea here uh, in Romans chapter 12. He says, therefore I urge you brethren by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of uh, worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So as Christ was in service to us, even to the point of offering his life as a payment for our sins, Paul says that our own lives should be spent or offered, he says, 
should be offered in service to others in the name of Christ. Now the two main misconceptions about Christian lifestyle, remember that I mentioned at the beginning, that it's all about rules and removing any happiness that we have and any fun in life, and the other misconception that it's mainly, you know, uh, Christianity is mainly about going to church. These two ideas are clarified by this passage here. True joy comes from knowing and doing God's will. And knowing His will, Paul says, is good and pleasing and perfect for us. He explains that reaching this goal requires Christians not to copy the sinful and evil practices of the world which go against God's will and purpose for our lives. God wants us to have joy. He wants us to have true pleasure and goodness in life. And all of these things come legitimately by obeying Him, not by disobeying Him. So when a Christian avoids immoral behavior of any kind, when a Christian makes an effort to be just or forgiving or generous, he's trying to do God's will and know the joy that comes from doing God's will. I've never seen much happiness come from adultery. Anybody here can uh, uh, give a testimony that in their life or in the life of somebody they know, Adultery, the, the, you know, somebody who's committed adultery has from that action received much joy. In 40 years of you know, counseling people and counseling married couples who have unfortunately have that experience, I've never seen a whole lot of joy come out of that. Anybody seen a lot of joy come from violence or dishonesty? Any happiness come to a, a married couple, for example, where both partners are selfish? <laughs> Do those people have a lot of joy in their marriage? How about pride? Does pride create happiness? Of course not. Christianity doesn't forbid anything that can increase our peace and joy and fulfillment in life. It does not deny us anything that will give us that. What God forbids Christians are those actions and attitudes that will take away what is good and perfect in this life. That's what he forbids. So the Christian lifestyle reflects the manner in which God directs our lives through the teachings of Jesus for our ultimate happiness and eternal good. You understand why I'm saying this? The misconception is, oh, Christians, you know, they don't have any fun. They don't, you know, there's no pleasure in the Christian life. And the point I made is, are you kidding me? Disobeying God never brings happiness. It brings excitement. It brings excitement. The Bible says, you know, uh, uh, pleasure of sin for a season the Bible doesn't deny that there's a, you know, a measure of pleasure or excitement attached to sinfulness, to disobedience, to rebellion. You know, go right back to the garden with Eve. You know, she looked at the fruit and says, wow, it looks pretty good you know, to eat. And it looks lovely. The packaging is nice. You know, and you know, he said, I'll be wise. You know, I'll be like God. I mean, the, the promise is great. Pretty exciting stuff. And then, of course, we know what happened. Well, it's the same thing with us. So try to remember the idea, God never forbids us something that will bring us joy and peace and legitimate happiness. He forbids us, he cautions us to avoid those things that in the end will harm us. And then the other idea, but the only thing that Christians do is go to church, Paul explains that the truest form of worship is the Christian lifestyle. That Christians offer themselves to God in service. That Christians purify themselves from sinfulness and worldliness. This is the purest form of worship and it is very pleasing to God. This doesn't mean that public worship is not important. It is important. But public worship is a time when Christians come together to do certain things, to praise and worship God publicly, 
to receive instruction and encouragement from their leaders, uh, to provide financial support for the work of the gospel, and to make a public witness of their faith in Jesus by sharing the communion. But all of these public actions are based on the fact that each Christian in the church has a Christian lifestyle throughout the week. Otherwise, it's simply public hypocrisy. <laughs> Christianity is about following Jesus every day. This exercise is the source of our strength and provides all the rewards of joy and peace and life eternal. I tell people, if you're not getting a whole lot out of worship, out of public worship, it may be because there's not enough private worship going on. And by private worship, I don't mean sitting down every day and taking 20 minutes to read your Bible, although that's a good thing, you know, but that's not what I'm talking about. Private worship, I'm talking about Romans chapter 12. Every day I'm offering my life up to God as a living sacrifice. Every day I'm finding ways that I can be obedient. Every day I'm finding ways that I can appreciate what he's done and give him honor for it in my heart, in my praise, every day. So going to church, as I said, is where we come together to share the joy and the strength and the understanding of the things that we've experienced throughout the week. If a person isn't living the Christian lifestyle during the week, going to church, no matter how many times, won't do him or her much good. But for the one who is truly following the Lord, church services are a great joy and a great blessing. They're not a burden. I, I mean, obviously I'm a, a minister, so I have to be here. I get paid to go to church. People say, that. yeah, you get paid to go to church. Boy, if I got paid to go to church, I'd be there all the time too, you know? <laughs> But I love public worship. I love being with the church. It's marvelous. You know. My friends, my mentors, uh, my family, it's all part of the church. You know, it's a marvelous thing. It's a wonderful thing. Well, I hope that uh, this lesson has uh, given you some insights into the Christian lifestyle and will help you in your daily walk with the Lord, whether you are just beginning or you've been with Him for many years. Uh, this is the last lesson in this series, Christianity for Beginners. I want to thank everybody for participating. Thank those who are watching uh, online, uh, appreciate that. If you want more Bible studies, I remind you to go to BibleTalk.tv, our uh, website and on that website you'll find sermons, other series, devotional books, articles, all kinds of resources that are free to help you not only grow your faith but also to share your faith with others. All right, that's the lesson. Thank you very much for your attention.